Hello and welcome to the big picture election special. In the run up to the general elections, we in the Raj Sabha TV are looking at various issues which concerns the country and should be addressed in a sober atmosphere. These are issues which are of vital importance but are normally discussed in an atmosphere of strife due to which only partisan debates take place. Today we will be looking at the vital issue of reforms in intelligence agencies and how and why there is a need for better accountability of these agencies including accountability to the parliament. For some time now, there has been some muted debate on this, though it has not reached any definitive conclusions. The fact that intelligence agencies have found themselves an attack for what is seen as lack of accountability, as well as the fact that it has no legislative backing, are all vital issues which affects not only the integrity of the nation, but also has a bearing on the rights of the citizens. We feel that not only sh should there be a debate on all these issues, but also the political parties need to take a stand on them so that we can see a legislation if necessary to come before the next Lok Sabha. We will discuss today all the pros and cons of this issue with Nalin Kohli, BJP spokesperson, Nilotpal Basu, Central Committee member, CPIM, DC Patak, former Director, Intelligence Bureau, uh, Salman So, spokesperson of the Congress party and Saikat Datta, Editor Investigations at the Hindustan Times. Welcome to all of you. Saikat, actually I would like to come to you first. You please set the agenda today. You know, they, there is this, this, this debate has been going on in this country for a few years, but although it has been quite a muted debate, uh, you think the Indian intellig intelligence agencies are prepared to accept parliamentary accountability, parliamentary oversight? You know, a few years ago, when Mr. Manish Tiwari was still an MP and not a minister, right. he put together a bill which I sort of worked with him along with the Observer Research Foundation and others. Private and members bill. A private members bill on creating a statutory position for our intelligence agencies and we called, the, called it the Intelligence Services Bill. And that bill was uh, admitted into parliament as a private members bill and the whole idea was that we start a debate in this country about what is happening. You see, we have inherited most of our structures from the United Kingdom. And in 1989, the United Kingdom actually decided to do something about their structures where their intelligence bureau, which is known as the Security Service or MI5, became, came under a statute of parliament called the Security Service Act. After that, in 1994, they also created a, another bill called the Intelligence Services Bill in 1994 for their secret intelligence services, which is SIS or MI6. Right. And then the British Parliament was still not happy and then they went ahead and created another act in 2000 called the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, which would also look at how the intelligence functions and what powers they will have and how they will function. You see, the beauty of this system is the Parliament, the British uh, Prime Minister has full control over the Parliamentary Committee which is created to do an oversight where he or she gets to choose who will be the members. The only criteria being that all the members should be from all the existing political parties. Right. Now this creates a non-partisan group which will not only give oversight for the intelligence agencies but will also give a lot of support to the intelligence agencies when they actually need it, Absolutely. which is not happening in this country Absolutely. at all. Absolutely. Um, uh, Saikat, you know, before, uh, before I go to the next uh, guest on my show, Let's have a look, a brief look at what this whole issue is about. Should our intelligence agencies be made answerable to the nation and exchequer? Are the elaborate budget set aside for intelligence justified given no intelligence is accountable? Is the money being wasted? Debate was initiated on the matter in 2010. Political parties have achieved a consensus on the need for this accountability. However, there remains a stress on the nature of these checks. और मैं समझता हूँ कि जवाबदेही और साथ साथ राष्ट्रीय सुरक्षा सुरक्षा संतुलित रूप से दोनों उपलब्ध हो सकती हैं। और अगर आप संसदीय समिति के आधार पर ठीक से करें ये, तो मैं समझता हूँ एक अंकुश अपने आप रहता है भी। Worldwide, intelligence bureaus are responsible to designated authorities or their respective president. For India, the vice president had suggested intelligence agencies be held accountable to a committee of parliament. But the sensitivity of the issue means debate persists on rules, situational cases and methodology. Ideally, is me, uh, political parties, judiciary, um, permanent executive, sabke 
बाकीदारी होना चाहिए कि अकाउंटेबिलिटी का डिफाइन करो इंटेलिजेंस का अकाउंटेबिलिटी का डिफाइन करने में इन सब का भागीदारी होना चाहिए मगर एक सेंस ऑफ हाई लेवल ऑफ रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी मैं ये नहीं बोल रही हूँ इरिस्पॉन्सिबल हो गए मगर रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी कहीं ना कहीं हम देश के सुरक्षा को मन में रखते हुए डिस्कस करना For years, there's been a taboo of sorts on questioning the expenses of our intelligence agencies, but the winds are changing. It's the age of accountability. With Sham Sundar, Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Okay, uh, let me get Salman Soz in on this. Salman, you come from a state which has, which is very sensitive. These issues keep cropping up in your state also periodically. you think that you know in 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 the present state of affairs indian intelligence agencies have been have been uh, you know uh, responsible to a great extent you need that you you do, do you think that these agencies need some oversight um i think uh, intelligence agencies uh, across the board should have greater oversight and i i, I think this idea that the parliamentary committee could uh, provide that oversight uh, the i think that's a very good idea uh, i don't really uh, you know I, I, i'm not sure uh, what the objection objections could be you know as far as sensitivity is concerned uh, uh, you know national secrets and other things uh, you know i'm sure that our mps are their oath bound I, i'm sure they're responsible people and uh, i see no reason why they cannot carry the people's mandate forward they're representing the people of this country and ultimately they should be uh, you know they should have oversight over uh, pretty much all government functioning and i think the problem with our intelligence agencies is that uh, some of them don't really have any uh, constitutional existence they don't and have that is a very very grave uh, uh, issue and and i think uh, i think uh, bringing them un under uh, bringing them under the purview of the constitution under uh, uh, you know under our system of governance which includes parliament the executive and uh, the supreme court i think uh, uh, ultimately would be beneficial for our country i think uh, we can't have total transparency obviously because uh, these are uh, intelligence agencies at okay. the same time having parliamentary oversight uh, you know not it would be kind of multi partisan or non partisan kind of oversight because everybody from parliament would be available I no way okay uh, selman my mind that's a good good idea okay selman uh, let us let us get let us get to know from the person who actually has been on the hot seat and what are the problems uh, mr patak you have been on the hot seat now this debate has been going on you have been you, i mean I, i have seen you you have written about these things you have been dis talking about these things what are the problems first let's discuss what are the problems if there needs to be a oversight you see we are discussing something which is of a strategic domain and not a one time event hmm. now i quite understand the um, the rationale behind the suggestion yes that there should be a parliamentary oversight over national intelligence agencies and somewhere i uphold the idea but two things must happen right things must happen the right way the the those who who take over the function of oversight must have a good understanding of how intelligence functions one number two the desire should be um Uh, to to improve the existing setup and not somewhere rip open what the national intelligence does as some kind of a bring in uh, quite bluntly play politics with national security i know i am in the midst of several uh, persons or political persons of uh, great credentials and authority i'm not saying that uh, politically national security is being meddled with but look at the internal security scene for instance if i were to define three major threats to internal security what will i say i'll say caste and communal violence regional exclusivism and the very strange phenomenon thousands of kilometers of our hinterland being in the hands of uh, mass insurgency which is not showing in signs of diminishing and yet if you see the rope, uh, i'm i'm not talking of any particular response from any particular quarters an informed citizen of india gets the impression that there is some kind of a political tint brought in whenever you discuss na national security issues so that's why i am saying that there's no 
there is no question that, that it should not be accepted. And the rationale why it, it is going to be accepted is that, you know, after independence, national intelligence worked under monolith of one political regime, but it worked under the trust and authorization from this political executive. Its ways were not wild ways. Now what is happening is that the political scene uh, in its totality, there is a problem between the political executive of the day having trust of the others. So I don't see it as a call for kind of a questioning uh, the, the working of the national intelligence agencies, but uh, something to be sorted out within the political executive of the day Let and me, the rest. I, I, th I, think, I, I think I get an idea of what your concerns are. Um, Nalin Kohli, and uh, you know, I'll come to Nilotpal next. Nalin Kohli, if, if, if I can understand what Mr. Patak says, Patak, a former director of the Intelligence Bureau, his concern is that in, in the process of this oversight, political parties may play politics on this issue. Well, it's a valid concern because after all, intelligence work has to have two elements to it. One is deniability sometimes. And at the other hand, I mean, you don't call a, a person working for gathering in, uh, uh, intelligence a spook for nothing because, you know, they are literally ghosts. Sometimes procedures uh, demand certain flexibility, functional flexibility that, uh, logically speaking, may fall into the realm where they can be questioned for having exercised that functional discretion or that functional freedom. That's on one end of the scale. And Mr. Jaitley has written about this in the past. Right. On the other hand is that, yes, there are issues involved between political parties and we have that experience where current political structures within parliament have also seen acrimony. Right. For today, let's keep the partisan Congress BJP approach out. But yes, can we say that, you know, we've had smooth sailing in, say, joint parliamentary committees, things like that. So there are questions here. And uh, when it comes to national strategic issues, uh, there can't be scope for error because the costs on the nation can be tremendous. And I think at the end of the day, whether it's any political party, our commitments individually and collectively to the nation as India is one has to be supreme and is supreme. So I think, you know, it's a fine line and it has to be looked at carefully because uh, as Mr. Patak is saying, if it throws open uh, a Pandora's box in terms of political or the political process taking over uh, functional requirements, there may be uh, unnecessarily clash. We've had also inter-services issues. So on the other hand, there is the other argument which says that many agencies do not work in a coordinated manner. Right. And therefore, there is duplicacy of work, there is domain fight, there is also protecting domain. So now there are various issues. I think the middle path is what's required, okay. which means looking at those strategic concerns and finding solutions that do not compromise the security and the strategic issues at the same time does not let anything become a law unto themselves. Right. Uh, Nilodpal, I mean, what Nalin Kohli is saying, what Salman is saying, not, you know, in the light of what Mr. The, the concerns expressed by Mr. Patak, this is a very thin line, fine line, which a balancing act which will have to be done. I think the program has been very well professed by Saikat by uh, relating to the uh, experience of the British uh, right. reforms. And I think it uh, also captures uh, the contemporary uh, concerns. Um, the immediate uh, uh, issue that comes to one's mind is the huge uh, debate which uh, took place uh, recently in the United States and it in fact spilled over to the whole of the world no, we, uh, in, the, in the light of the Snowden revelations. Absolutely. And uh, therefore, I think we are living in 21st century and therefore as much as uh, national security is a concern, uh, equally so uh, the citizens' rights, how to combine the two. Right. At one point in time when the NDA government was there, there was a huge obsession with national security and a national yeah. the first time. And uh, in fact, it was a good idea. Only the problem was 
to provide statutory backup to the structure of National Security Council. Right. So under the broad umbrella of National Security Council and this uh, I think actually Nilopal, actually include different components uh, Nilopal, Nilopal. Of, 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 of civil and uh, executive life uh, and also experts. Nilotpal, Nilotpal, there seems to be a problem with your audio. We will fix it. I'll come back to you. Let me go to um, uh, Saikat. Saikat, you know, in, in the light of all these things, the present, what is the present state of affairs? Are the accountability, accountability mechanisms which are now in place you know, as far as the intelligence agencies are concerned, are they working effectively? Are they, you know, are they efficient? Let me try and answer that questions by framing the points that, or the concerns that Mr. Pathak and right. Mr. Kohli have raised. Right. And both have raised very relevant uh, points on this issue. Let us look at what Mr. Pathak is saying. What of, a lot of things that he's saying is very, very relevant. And he, nobody can understand that better than somebody who spent his whole life in the intelligence community. Right. And, and he, he, he makes valid points that, you know, there are a lot of sensitivities involved which may or may not apply to other forms of governance. And if I'm not wrong, Mr. Kohli is also echoing some of those issues. But let us look at the experience across the rest of the world. Since 1949, there has been an act of the US Congress which decides the structure of the CIA and the National Security Agency and the FBI. In 1970s, two, Sen two US Congress committees were set up, the Pike Committee and another committee, I forget the name, the Church Committee. Now, both these committees looked into the ills that affect the CIA and the National Security Agency and the problems thereof. And there was a little bit of bloodshed, but the experience has been the intelligence agencies have become a much better agency than any other uh, any other agency in, across the rest of the world. And the same kind of debates are taking place in the United Kingdom and 120 other countries where there is some kind of parliamentary oversight of intelligence agencies. My brief point is that with this experience that we now have, there is empirical evidence to show that no harm is done to the intelligence agencies. And the other final point that I would like to add at this juncture of the debate is that what does the constitution say? The Intelligence Bureau was initially created by a telegram sent by the <laughs> Secretary for South Asia, for India in the 1800s, uh, in the 19th century. And that really hasn't changed as far as the Intelligence Bureau is concerned. It still functions practically like a colonial era agency. Right. But the, but the uh, constitution in the seventh schedule gives the government and the parliament the power to create a central intelligence bureau by an act of parliament and but if that the has happened. no the point is that the constitutional provision is there and obviously the fathers the who wrote the fathers of our nation who wrote the constitution have actually given that provision because they believe that that is the way forward and and as far as the politics and bipartisan uh, approach is concerned what mr kohli has referred to i think he's using the wrong examples the joint parliamentary committee is not a very good example instead let us look at the consultative committee of home affairs where the director intelligence bureau actually goes along with the home minister to answer the questions of parliamentarians all we are saying is let us formalize this in a much better manner where the Prime Minister of the country can get to choose who the members from which parties will be on that committee. And I'm sure each party will give their best and finest parliamentarians who will come and decide and oversee these issues. Saikar, but my question, my other question was, are the existing mechanisms, accountability mechanisms, how are they working, are they effective? You see, as far as the intelligence accountability is concerned, in my view, and it's a fairly conservative view, the accountability mechanism doesn't really function. And, and we have treated this subject as a holy cow for so long that not only is it affecting a lot of human rights issues, but a bigger problem is it, it is affecting the efficiency of these agencies. Right. Yes, yes Nalan, quickly. Nalan? I have two points to make. I think the principle is getting lost somewhere of what I'm trying to say. My example of the JPC is to point about a lack of consensus between political parties. It is not about the structure. And I think we should be clear about this. Nowhere am I saying that the commitment to democracy or a citizen's rights can be compromised. At the same time, I'm merely flag pointing 
about the functional requirements of an agency which cannot function on the basics of how we run other institutions. So I'm talking of the middle path that right. neither has to be compromised. No. But at, uh, you know, you, so therefore, and, I, and therefore my example is in the larger picture, not in a specific what manner has to be done, whether it's the British model, whether we come up with our own model, that is something that has Absolutely. to be thought about in a Absolutely. No, way. Even I, I think mean, obviously, I think so there's Saikat, no doubt about that. I think Saikat also was just giving an example of the consultative committee, which could be one of the mechanisms which, which could be thought of. Uh, Mr. Patak, Mr. Patak, uh, you know, what is, you know, the US experience, the UK experience, which uh, uh, Saikat was talking about, are they <coughs> good? Uh, examples for us? Are they good role models for us? Or do you think that in the Indian context, we can't just follow what they have done blindly? There are two points. As a former director IV, I can say that uh, if I were the chief today, uh, I would not mind if, if the intelligence setup gets a legal kind of a validation. Because so it's a legislative seems, framework. Wait, wait, wait. You're talking of a legislative framework. But I We mean, don't have a legislative framework. Law comes out of the legislation. That's right. right. So, uh, uh, and maybe that's something more strong than merely working on the trust and authorization of the political executive of the day is is required. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't. Uh, it, it shouldn't bother the, the chiefs of national intelligence agencies if there is a law which validates their existence and functioning. But the functioning, you can't tinker with the functioning and. This is my whole point. I mean, the, the point is that those who wish to provide oversight mechanism, are they trained into understanding the nuances of, of need to know principle on which the national security I, works out this? No, one second. So, so I'm, I'm sure, I'm so sure, that's I'm why, sure, I'm sure no, the, no, no, the, the politicians why, on the panel will respond no, to no, that. No, no, that, my, that's, but why, my, that's why, But my little counter question, way out no, no, my little counter question is, there is, a, there is a committee of the parliament which deals with science and technology. I am sure all, not all the members in that committee will have any understanding of the details of, the, of science and technology. I'm sure they, yeah, they, they'll yeah, be able to the, understand. The one, let, let me say what I've written about on this subject, yes. because I feel very strongly on this subject. I said the right way of doing it. I mean, we have almost a dozen agencies spread across various ministries right. and this thing. And therefore, I have said that you must establish a, a round table at the center where all the chiefs bring whatever they have to say on a major problem, converge it. Who will run this table? We round table. We have to have a national intelligence advisor who doesn't tinker with the autonomous function of the individual agencies. The but, national but, security uh, advisor doesn't so, work. So, so this, work. No, national, you know. The national security I, advisor. I would rather, uh, my frank view is that we need a national intelligence advisor, national security advisor team, not just national security advisor, unless this gentleman has an intelligence background. We had it once, right? Right. So, I mean, what does this, uh, uh, what, what does it require? The coordination, that information flows to a uh, convergence point. Then you, 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 you say that has anything gone wrong? And, and intelligence agencies are very transparent from inside. They look opaque from outside. They even know who is, who is where, who, who will succeed whom. So, you know, <laughs> that is, and therefore, if that is a... I, know, I mean, that is, that I'm that, sure in every government organization, everybody is looking at who will succeed. No, what I'm saying, what I'm that, saying uh, is that arrangement, accountability, you talk, coordination, oversight, and accountability, these three things can be done by a national intelligence advisor who also provides the interface with the parliamentary committee because all the chiefs going to the parliament committee is not on. Parliamentary committee needs to know what is the assessment of the major threats, what is the direction of response, and how the agencies are being run. And if there is any matter which has come into public space about deviation, then... What about expenditure? He, what about expenditure? Because that is one, that is one, very, that's one very controversial issue. I, when we don't know how much... I mean, are you, how much you, come on, how much come on. You, you are keen to know how secret service funds are being spent, that right? Is, I mean, that, I mean not, how, how can that, anything that, be that, more... That is, that, uh, is, that, more, that is one of the major... More concerns. trivial than going into this. And as far as the funding of national security agencies are concerned, uh, without quoting figures, I can say that it needs to be improved. You, it's it not enough. Not very much in my it's time not in enough. any case. Nilodpal? Nilodpal, see, if, if, I, if I understand 
the concerns of Mr. Patak. The intelligence community still is not very keen. They, they still think that you know if this oversight, if it is set up, will be manned by people who may not be really um, you know equipped enough to understand the uh, functioning of the intelligence agencies. Uh, with uh, due regards to Mr. Patak, I think uh, maybe there is uh, some uh, communication deficit in terms of the functioning of parliamentary committees. And I think at the same time, I must also address uh, uh, Naling's concerns. I think uh, his uh, sense of the parliamentary committee is too much clouded by the manner in which uh, the Joint Parliamentary Committee on 2G spectrum uh, functioned. No, I now, can first of all, Na first of all, first Nilodpal, of all, Nilodpal, you are the only MP on this panel who has, you know, who has been there for 12 years. Obviously, you will have a better understanding. I can't blame Nalin for this, actually. Uh, so, so that is that is the thing. I mean, normally in 99% of the cases, uh, there will be a bipartisan approach, and I think for this, it is very important uh, that uh, which will upset you, media people, that it should be in camera. Uh, it, it, it should not be televised. Uh, the second point I think Mr. Patak uh, uh, is, uh, uh, should appreciate that the parliamentary committee can always summon uh, the best of experts, uh, not just within the country but from outside the country. And you see, uh, uh, you have to have parameters for how this oversight will function. The control will of course be with the executive, but we are talking not of control but of uh, accountability. Uh, now, uh, we, you cannot go into the operational details. You have to decide on principles uh, and uh, expenditure. I think, again, uh, I, I would tend to agree with Mr. Patak that, you see, expenditure is something which is part of the uh, 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 operational details in which the parliamentary committee did not go. Uh, I mean, w w overall goals, uh, the direction, the thrust, uh, those are the kind of things and whether uh, the uh, intelligence activity is in consonance with our uh, foreign policy uh, perception and the foreign policy objectives. I, I think uh, 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 what we are seeing a bizarre uh, situation where United States uh, cannot uh, explain to its uh, allies or even the manner in which uh, uh, those uh, uh, targets were uh, actually targeted. Right. So I, I think those uh, political and strategic aspects, uh, certain uh, overall uh, objectives, those are the kind of things. And I think in that sense, uh, what uh, Shaikat was uh, uh, stating about the British experience, I think we can approach that with a certain degree of customization uh, in the light of uh, what uh, specifics uh, exist in the Indian conditions, that okay. would be a good thing. Okay. I think at this at, at this point, let's go into a very short break now. This is an interesting discussion. We'll come back very soon and continue this. Please keep watching. Welcome back. In this special edition, election edition of the Big Picture, we are looking at the issue of intelligence agencies and whether they should there should be a parliamentary oversight on the functioning of these agencies. Uh, Salman Soos, coming to you. you, you think that, you know, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the light of what we have been discussing, you think that every political party at this point of time going into the elections, you know, discussing what should be done, you know, should have this, this issue on its mind when a new government is formed. You think that it is time now for the parliament to look at this issue? Absolutely. I think uh, we've had, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the past year or two, we've had some problems where, uh, you know, uh, uh, aspersions have been cast on the workings of the intelligence agencies. And, you know, frankly, uh, Parliament does have a right uh, of oversight. I do, I do appreciate the concerns that Mr. Patrick has expressed, uh, but I think uh, those can be allayed. You know, uh, uh, if, if parliamentarians and other countries can be trusted uh, to provide uh, uh, the oversight to their intelligence agencies. I'm sure that we can trust our parliamentarians too. After all, they are uh, patriotic, they're nationalists, and uh, they are looking out for the best interests of this country. I do agree that yes, I mean, he listed out three uh, uh, prime, prime uh, threats, uh, security threats to this country, and there may not always be agreement, uh, you know, uh, between politicians for that matter. 
but at the same time, I have, my, my sense is that when, when parliamentary committees meet, I think, uh, and if these committees are chosen uh, with great sensitivity, perhaps with the involvement of uh, you know, the Prime Minister, the Speaker of the House, the, the Chairman of the Rajya Sabha, and the two leaders of the, oppo leaders of the opposition, uh, and, and creating some sensit uh, you know, sensitizing MPs about uh, their task, I think they can perform uh, their duties fairly well. Uh, the other point that Nelanji also mentioned about, uh, you know, he talked about, uh, you know, sometimes lack of coordination between different intelligence agencies um, uh, and duplication of work. I think having parliamentary oversight can actually help reduce that by being a kind of a focal point where you actually get all of the information of what different Absolutely. agencies are doing. Like, like Mr. Uh, and, uh, you know, that could be one uh, way forward. Mr. Mr. Patak was talking about Sorry? the National Intelligence Advisor. Maybe that is where the, everything should converge and, you know, that's an idea which, 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 which can be discussed. I'll come to you. Uh, yes, Mr. Patak. Uh, uh, may I say that I'm extremely delighted to find a lot of convergence of thought on this discussion table on a very important subject. Uh, uh, the political convergence uh, you're talking uh, about. No, th there is no reason why the interface, whosoever is providing the interface on behalf of the national intelligence with the parliamentary committee is not able to answer all the questions. I mean, there is no, and intelligence lives from failure to failure. So there might be some inadequacies. I mean, but there's nothing personal in it. So I think the difficulty, so the, you, you, the difficulty of a dialogue between a professional and the parliamentary committee, I, I, I see no difficulty you, in that. No difficulty. You don't think that there'll be any difficulty if the parliamentary committee says why in a particular case was this failure? You think that this is some, this is a, this will be a healthy uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. thing I mean, I mean that the, the intelligence bureau director will come and explain why there was a the, failure of intelligence. Uh, For instance, uh, yesterday, the Supreme Court has made a statement about the failure of intelligence in the Muzaffar Nagar riots. And this is something which, which will never get discussed openly the intelligence bureau will never be able to come out with its own version of why it, why it has failed or not failed. You think no. this kind of a thing will provide that kind of a no, what, whatever, uh, platform? Whatever the Supreme Court has said, uh, see it as, as being said in an individual context of a happening. I mean, I, I'm not spilling the beans, but, uh, but I've handled the communal front for years and years. And, and we believe that when there is a communal rights like a war, there is an incubation period of tension of which notice should be taken and very scientific methods were tried sought to be devised for that. But coming back to the, the, the uh, I mean, this gentleman who is facing the parliamentary committee should be professional enough to say yes, explain the inadequacy and set the, the uh, uh, these people at rest mentally. I mean, that's the national no, not objective. Just, not just these people, the nation, the, the, the country will be, uh, you know, will have a lot of concerns about it. Saikat, coming back to you, you know, Mr. Patak is being very positive about this, except, you know, he has certain concerns. But you think that the, in, the, in the intelligence committee, Patak, Patak was a, was a little, uh, you know, his, he, he was there for a, some time back. Now you think that the, in the present intelligence community, which, are, which is functioning, which are working, you think that the, the, you will find the same kind of uh, positivity towards something like this, uh, you know, some, having an oversight over it? Well, my experience has been, and I have dealt extensively with the Research and Analysis Wing and the Intelligence Bureau, and I find there is a certain amount of confusion about these issues. So as a result, many people would at times welcome such a step, but at the same time are a little bit resistant to this because there is a lack of understanding on both sides, whether in, within the intelligence community or whether in some parts of the political establishment. You see, whenever you set up a committee, what is the job of such a committee? And as Mr. Nilotpal Basu has very correctly pointed out, and this is the point that I was trying to stress on, that parliamentary standing committees and consultative committees have worked for decades and have created great consensus and great reports. I remember there used to be this MP from Madhya Pradesh from uh, the BJP who produced some of the finest standing committee reports from the standing committee of defense and a lot of work immediately died down as soon as he stepped down as chairman of that committee. So the point that Mr. Pathak is trying to make, I don't entirely agree with it when he says that these people should be aware of the, how in intelligence works and so on and so forth. I mean, of course, that is welcome. But what does a parliamentary standing committee do? It examines the politics of a certain function of government. And as Mr. Basu and others have pointed out, it also gives the broad strategic direction in which those uh, agencies should function. So what, so what we are... 
Yeah. Second, my question is this, you know, one of the things which is less discussed, always whispered, rumored, speculated is about the way the intelligence agencies are used, misused, abused by political parties, especially political parties in power. Yes. You know, you know, this is one major issue which, which doesn't get discussed uh, in public much. You, you think this is one area which can, which can be regulated in some manner if this kind of a oversight is established? Absolutely. And in fact, that's my point that you see today when you see an intelligence bureau, as Mr. Pathak very well knows, has a limited resource of skilled people as well as severe limitations in terms of money and finances. In a situation like that, when they should be primarily combating threats to internal security, if you divert some of the sources away to gather political intelligence, I would think that is a criminal waste of skilled manpower as well as our financial, limited financial resources. Now, the only way, and I believe the only way you can stop this is through a parliamentary oversight mechanism where you have a bipartisan committee, where mm -hmm. everybody gets to know that this is where we are getting the maximum bang for the buck. Okay, Salman. Salman, this is a real problem. Do you admit, you, you know, maybe you have not had direct, direct uh, uh, experience with this, but you know, you have, you come from a family of politicians, you, you, uh, you've seen the politics every, in Kashmir and other places. Do you, do you agree that political parties in power inevitably misuse intelligence agencies? I think a huge cloud would be lifted uh, off, uh, uh, you know, the intelligence, uh, intelligence community if uh, we had parliamentary oversight. Because no matter what government you have, what kind of political executive have, you have, no matter how well-meaning they are, there will always be allegations of misuse and there will be some misuse. I think, there, the, you know, I think that happens in every government. And I think uh, that is why, uh, you know, parliamentary oversight would be uh, a beneficial thing. And the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, Girish, before I have to really, really leave, but I wanted to mention that we don't really have to go for big bang reform all at once. We could take incremental steps, start, learn, and incorporate whatever we learn, and then move to the next stage of reform. Okay. So we don't really have to do everything at once. So uh, we can you know, do an incremental in, in, approach. Okay. I'm sorry, I have to go. Okay, okay. Sorry, Thank you. Th thanks, thanks for joining us, Salman. Yes, Mr. Patek. Um, I want to say uh, on a somewhat personal note. No, no, but, but uh, th th that that as director, I be I served with three prime ministers of three different political backgrounds, and uh, all of them, all of them impressed me as people of 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 real uh, good thinking and in depth thinking, uh, and extending this to uh, the, uh, the members of the parliamentary committee. I, I, I think we can move towards a very smooth way of satisfying the nation that parliamentary oversight no, but is you giving started everybody off, a satisfaction. You started off with certain concerns. Now you seem no, to no, be that, more I, and more I mean, uh, you know, warming up no, no, the no, idea no, of no, having no, this. No, I'll no, tell but, you. No, that's fine. No, no, suppose, I'm, suppose I'm briefing the parliamentary committee. They raise a question which uh, 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 the reply to which is, look, this, is, this cannot be discussed. So, so, where is the problem? Okay. No, but my question, which I asked Sal, uh, Salman and uh, Saikat also, about political interference in the functioning of the I intelligence agency. Is, isn't this, is, I'll come to you, Nalin, very quickly. Uh, isn't this, isn't this a real problem? It, it, I know, from, not, it's not just at the highest level of the director intelligence bureau, right from the lowest operative of the intelligence bureau, right to the top. Don't you think this is a problem, which is a real problem? Now look, somebody made a mention of the British tradition. You know that our one good tradition we have inherited from the British is that our national intelligence decides in its own judgment when a threat is cropping up. They don't have to take anybody's permission to start covering it. So this is the bulk of the task, national security oriented. If some leader at some point of time asks for something to be done, I'm, I'm not able to comment on that because this didn't happen. I, I, I had no such problem. And in any case, this doesn't detract from the main function of the political national in, Gathering national political intelligence, in, intelligence at, the, at, the, at the behest of the ruling party. Are you trying to say that this doesn't exist? No, no. I think, I think not existing and whether this is the main theme, I think you should make a difference between the two. So you and, and, and I think I, I feel most concerned by this blatant, wild kind of a uh, uh, thought floated in public that, that national intelligence work at the behest of some particular political set masters. This certainly does not happen. Nalin? 
Nalan, yes. You know, this, this is a major issue which every political party should look into, look it, look at it inside. You know, I can't. I really can't comment on it. Yeah, I really you can't, can't comment, comment on, it. on it. Yes, because uh, actually, I haven't had the exposure to that aspect. Right. But uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, this discussion is looking at it in a bipartisan way, and you know, these are issues that eventually will get discussed because uh, at the end of the day, you know, you can't have anything in a democracy that's not accountable. I was. I my point, just my limited point throughout, has just been. That the, uh, the functional aspect has to be taken. We can't have, you know, fixed formulas for anything. That's all. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, whatever is required in the national interest eventually will be done. Mr. Uh, Girish, as you know, Nalan, I need to make Nalan, a Nalan, Just, just so one question, one question before you leave. You think that your party will, will, will take this up as an issue which needs to be... Uh, you know, taken up, say, in the next government, the next Lok Sabha, is this, do you think your party would be able, would, would be committing itself to looking at this issue and coming out with some solution by the time the next Lok Sabha ends? I am not, a, the honest, the honest answer is, I am not in a position to give you a concrete answer on that because this could be a potential uh, point of view for the next government. But every government that will come in after an election is bound to have a set of priorities to look at because you think this should be the priority into government. You think this should and be the priority? Perhaps, well, I mean, security of the nation. Let me rephrase it in a different way. Security of the nation is of paramount importance, internal as well as, as well as external. And anything that will improve India's handling of these issues, I think, will definitely be a priority for any government that comes into power. Okay. Th thank you, Nalin. Thanks for not joining us. But Nilotpal, Nilotpal, they, you know, again, I want you to admit because you have had more experience than any of the people on the uh, any of the pol other political party people on the panel about about the interference of the political class or the pol pe parties in power uh, on uh, with, with the intelligence agencies you think you d don't you re don't you agree that it's a reality which needs to be tackled it's an absolute reality i mean uh, uh, mr pathak has been uh, so so reasonable otherwise but the assertion uh, which he is making, I don't want to make uh, uh, or join issues with him, but I just point out that uh, there are tons of material. For example, uh, in relation to the encounter deaths in Gujarat and the involvement of the IB there. So I think uh, we need not point out that is uh, part of the court records as part of the uh, affidavit. No, it's, it's, a, it's a sub matter uh, now in any so, case. So, 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 therefore, I am not going into that. What I am saying, I mean to further reassure Mr. Pathak and his concerns that, in fact, uh, uh, one must distinguish between uh, clandestinism and professionalism. Now, sometimes professional agencies are subjected uh, to undertake clandestine activities uh, which is really not keeping with the overall mandate of that agency. Uh, I think uh, parliamentary uh, accountability will also uh, help the agency uh, in really uh, sidelining that kind of uh, pressures which might otherwise come from the uh, political executive. I think uh, uh, it is not a fact that there are no pressures. I mean, uh, yes, uh, on its own, maybe the national intelligence will not do that. Um, but um, we have also seen situations when you ask people uh, to, to uh, kneel and they start crawling. Right. And uh, yes. that, that are that subject is... to political, political circumstances. Uh, I think everybody should, should be I mean, uh, prudent enough to appreciate that. So that, that, that saying doesn't uh, just apply to the media as some, some people say, but it applies to maybe bureaucracy and all this. Saikat, coming back to you. Saikat, you know, we are discussing the national intelligence agencies. You know, the question of state intelligence agencies, how they are misused, how they function, what kind of problems they face? You think the same thing can, could be replicated, whatever mechanism that we evolve at the national level could be replicated at the state level also? Well, that's a very interesting question and to be very frank with you, I have not thought about it. But yes, the basic principles would apply. And to give you certain concrete examples about this, for example, in 2010, when I was with the Outlook magazine, I had done a cover story on how 
मिस्टर दिग्विजय सिंह मिस्टर नीतीश कुमार मिस्टर प्रकाश कराट मिस्टर शरद पवार दीज आर पीपल हुड कम अंडर सम काइंड ऑफ सर्वेलेंस बाय एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन कॉल्ड द नेशनल टेक्निकल रिसर्च ऑर्गेनाइजेशन दे वर देयर फोन्स वर टैप्ड देयर फोन्स वर टैप्ड एंड दिस वाज डन बाय अ न्यू इक्विपमेंट व्हिच पीपल इन द पब्लिक डिड नॉट नो अबाउट हाउ जस्ट बाय प्लेसिंग देम ऑन द स्ट्रीट्स यू कैन फ्रॉम द एयर पिक अप दोस सिग्नल्स ऑफ सेल फोन्स राइट नाउ सो दैट एट दैट टाइम देयर वाज अ फैंटास्टिक डिबेट बिटवीन the then home minister mr chidambaram and then the leader of the opposition in the rajya sabha mr arun jetli and i would request all my panelists here to actually read those debates and some very fine points were come now the other concrete example that i want to bring about is what is happening in america right now the senate the joint senate committee on intelligence which is supposed to do oversight is now clashed in a battle with the cia because now evidence has come out that the cia was spying on these very senators these very congressmen these very parliamentarians who are supposed to do uh, oversight uh, on them <laughs> yes yes now my point is if agencies and there are always chances of rogue elements because when you have power power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely when you have such powerful agencies in india for example where they are not under any act of parliament there is no proper me- mechanism etc even even a joint director in the intelligence bureau can actually do a lot of things without the mechanism coming to light of what what is happening right. my brief point is this that in situations like this who protects the very principles of democracy on which these countries exist a parliamentary committee can do a lot to protect those principles of democracy which is critical to the functioning and the survival of a nation like ours okay mr mr patak actually when we are discussing all these things when you are discussing oversight when we are discussing the issue of accountability and things like that the basic premise is that is that you know there can always be rogue elements who can like what uh, psychiatrist is talking about in fact all these things are necessary to control them what you are talking about is are good people honest people people who who would like to stick to uh, you know the, the rules and regulations and wh- whatever mandate is given to them the problem is when these rogue elements so do, do you think that with even after all this oversight mechanism is put in place you can control the rogue elements the intelligence bureau has a convention like what you know one second sorry uh, what psychic spoke about 2010 there was this equipment which was being used to tap you know people uh, at random which included some very senior politicians and ministers how does that kind of a thing come under control i can i can only tell you in my time i first understand the security is a uh, protection against covert threats the enemy is invisible his Absolutely. planning is right so the information about that which is intelligence is is not available on the shelves that you go and no. buy it right so the logic of how 24/7 effort is launched by an entire organization to to get at somewhere where neutralization of the adversary can take place so they use covert methods but these covert methods are used on the authority of somebody outside of the ib ib cannot do any telephone uh, interception without the authority it's not supposed to it's of, not supposed to no 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 but what you are talking is an ideal situation no, what no. happens is the not, second point is that yes. the intelligence bureau functions in a manner that the chief takes responsibility for all the failure of an individual under him he may not take credit for all the good work that the people below have done because he is not in need of that kind of a thing so why should a chief uh, uh, allow any such kind of a unbecoming no, thing you are, uh, uh, can, can i can i pose yes, a question yes 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 can yes. i quickly pose a question yes yes we we've, we've recently seen a navy chief resign from service right because people perceive that he as the man in the chair was responsible right we've had enough intelligence failures in this country There right not from been Kargil, a single single ib Kargil chief to, yeah. has any ib chief has any rnaw chief ever resigned from their service taking moral responsibility for what they so i i buy this argument that the chiefs are responsible but i've never in the last 65 years seen any one of them take responsibility no, and no, that for, precisely is the problem forget i mean forget taking responsibility is any fix, responsibility fixed by the government also that also is a problem exactly we have not, 
Nilotpal, we have not seen you know, you know, any of these intelligence uh, agency operatives, the responsibility being fixed for the f actually, I don't know this Gujarat case, I, I, I would be, I, will, I can stand corrected, Saikat uh, or Mr. Patak can stand, correct me. The, is this the first time that we are seeing a very senior uh, uh, intelligence officer being being charged with the kind of cases which he, which has, which he has been charged with in Gujarat? Yes, that is correct. Nilot, Nilotpal? Yeah, I think I think uh, I I uh, like Mr. Patak's spirit, but you see, it is really uh, uh, utopian. Uh, truth is not uh, available in just black and white. There are gray shades and all that. Now this uh, is a forum where we are frankly discussing issues. So you see, left to themselves, they cannot be expected to be accountable. You see, as uh, Shaikat was very correctly pointing out, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Therefore, there has to be a principle of check and balance. There has to be accountability. And uh, there has to be uh, uh, benchmarkable parameters to do that. Nobody is saying that uh, in areas where you need flexibility, that parliamentary committee will poke its nose. But at the same time, uh, certain uh, broad goals, certain broad directions, certain broad objectives, whether the agency is functioning, whether the community is functioning in consonance with that, that is something uh, which cannot be left alone to the uh, functioning operatives. Okay, Mr. Patek, let we are coming to the end of the show. I just want you to, if if you have to, you know, say one, two, three, four. These are the things which which the intelligence agencies needs to be, you know, the oversight needs to be there on these on these aspects, and these are the aspects one, two, three, four where you can't have this kind of oversight. Can you can you just? You see, I I think that the, this domain of oversight, I see it as an instrumentality by which the political executive of the day will give satisfaction to rest of the national leadership that everything is being handled properly. Think, things but, are in, but, things but, are in but the fact that, I mean, uh, DI director, I will not going to be interrogated by the parliament committee. Certainly. We have to create an interface by which this representative body of, of parliament is professionally briefed in a manner which gives them total satisfaction. We cannot, uh, uh, we cannot would, play would, with the, no, with no, the would, basics would, of how national uh, intelligence Would you think, would you think that, that what, what should be the mandate of the intelligence? Is, is this something which needs to be put down in paper? Do we have, we don't have that kind of a thing? No, no. <coughs> I, I mentioned to you the, the, the tradition of the British. It can be reduced to black and white. That it, the it should be reduced to black and white. And what about national administration? intelligence should take notice on their own of any developing threat to national security, security and, and start doing whatever they have to that, do that, to Saikat, Saikat, you know, we, we don't, we still don't have very quickly. We make we, it so non-political that in that way. Yes, we do, we still don't have a mandate of, for the intelligence agencies, which, which could be, which, you know, can help actually the intelligence agencies to function within a, within a framework instead of just going haywire and doing all kinds of things and, you know, coming under suspicion. No, you see, after the 99 Kargil war and the Kargil task force, under Mr. Gary Saxena, a joint uh, task force for intelligence was set up and they made some concrete uh, recommendations and one of the recommendations was that each of the agencies that are, exist and which is being set up will have a charter. You see, the problem is the charters today exist, but are they following it? Are they following it in the most optimal manner possible? Nobody is there to actually examine those questions in a professional manner and which I personally feel only a parliamentary standing committee can do. Okay, Nilotpal, very quickly, last words to you. You think that this, this issue should become, a, a, you know, a concerns should be taken up by the, by, by the next Lok Sabha, by the next government. You think that the, the time has come for this issue to be taken up seriously and, and to work out, a, create some kind of a legislative framework around it? Absolutely, because you see, uh, this not only the intelligence question, uh, that overall national security question, because uh, now the kind of noise one hears all around, uh, there is a, a big propensity by some of the political forces to absolutely politicalize and sensationalize national security. 
and uh, if at all uh, we need actually bipartisanism on the, this kind of issue and it cannot be done without going through the parliamentary route and uh, through uh, without uh, formulating a, a appropriate legislation. Okay, I think on that note we need to end. It has been a very interesting debate, a very serious debate. Hopefully the next government, the next Lok Sabha, the next parliament session we will see this, these issues being taken up and taken to a logical conclusion where we can see that these agencies also function in a manner in which they should be functioning with responsibility, keeping in, keeping in view the human rights as well as the national security issue into concern. Thanks to all my guests, uh, Nilotpal Basu, Saikat Datta, DC Patak and uh, Salman Soz and Nalin Kohli who had joined us earlier. Please keep watching. We'll come back next week with another issue on the big picture election special.